Amen. John chapter 17, we looked at verses 1 through 5 where Jesus prayed for himself. Verses 6 through 19, Jesus prayed for his apostles. And in verses uh, 20 through 26, Jesus is praying for all Christians or all believers of all time. And uh, as we look at this prayer, we see how that Jesus is praying when he prayed for his apostles... He gave them the words that they were to preach. And of course, the Holy Spirit was going to come upon them after He goes back to heaven and give them further revelation, which would complete the New Testament message. And He also prayed in verse 11 for the apostles to be one. And uh, we we talked about that Wednesday night. He also prayed that they were to be uh, sanctified by the truth, God's word being truth. Now, of course, that's not limited to the apostles. That's for all of God's people to be sanctified uh, according to the truth. And how does, how does the truth of God's Word sanctify us as the people of God? That's a good summation teaches us how to get the forgiveness of sins and teaches us how to live our life. And when we live our life the way God wants us to live, we're going to be, what, distinct. We're going to be distinct from the world. And uh, this is what's known as pure and undefiled religion before God. James chapter 1, verse 27 Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That's sanctify, to be set apart. So this is pure and undefiled religion before God. So we see this as being a part of it. We're to take care of widows and orphans, those who are in need, and to keep ourselves sanctified according to the truth of God's Word. And when you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, this shows why that Christians and faithful churches of Christ are distinct from everyone else. That we're not trying to be like everyone else, we're trying to be what God wants, and when we do that, we're going to be distinct from everyone else. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he says in verse 14, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Bial? And what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That's talking about the church. Therefore, verse 17, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Sanctify yourself according to the truth, God says. I will receive you. You'll be acceptable to me. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the Spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. I believe that chapter 7 and verse 1 should be verse 19 of chapter 6. Remember, those chapter and verses are man-made to help us find verses. And sometimes the, the the chapter and verse divisions... I don't understand why they would break it in the middle of a thought because chapter 7 and verse 1 goes along with what he's saying. So, uh, but anyway, this is why we cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So that separates us. That's how we're sanctified by the truth of God's word and God's word is truth. That, again, goes back to trusting 
the truth of God's word and not our feelings, not our emotions, not our intuition, not our gut feelings or uh, what we might think about something. We have to bring ourselves under the thinking of God's will, surrender ourselves to that and comply with it and then we'll be what God wants us to be and then the emotions will come. We will go on our way rejoicing. That will be the byproduct of doing God's will. Now in verses 20 through 26, Jesus prays for all believers. And this, to me, this is a special section of the prayer because this has you and, you and me in mind. Has us in mind. Because he's praying for everyone who is a true believer according to the biblical definition that he has in mind as he's praying for our behalf and for our salvation. And notice what it says. I do not pray for these alone, but I also pray for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. I and them, you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you you have loved them. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, The world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. I have declared to them your name, and will declare it that the love which that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. So here going back to verse twenty, I don't pray for these alone, talking about his apostles, but for Uh, also those who believe in me through their word. That's going to talk about everyone from Acts chapter 2 forward. The day of Pentecost till right now. We believe in Jesus through their word. I've never seen Jesus with my eyes. I've never heard him with my ears. I've never touched him with my hands. I've never detected him with any of my senses. I believe in Jesus through their word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Where is that? Romans 10 and verse 17. That's how we have faith. And therefore, we believe on Jesus through their word. By the way, that's why we're not witnesses. We're not witnesses of Jesus. No one today can go out and witness for Jesus. I know the claim is made, but that is a a misuse of that biblical term. Only those who have been with Jesus physically, saw him physically, touched him physically, are witnesses and can bear testimony. We preach their word. We preach the scriptures. That's why Paul told Timothy, preach the word. Preach the word. Have you ever noticed when you read 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus that Paul never says anything about their testimony or tells them to bear witness? You know why? Timothy and Titus didn't see Jesus. They can't bear witness. They can't give a testimony. But what can they do? Preach the word. That's what they were told to do. Preach the word. They preached the word of those who were witnesses. I find that very, very interesting. Sometimes what the Bible doesn't say can be more interesting in some respects than what it actually does say. Paul and Timothy were not told to bear witness for Jesus Christ. They'd never seen him. That speaks volumes. They were told to preach to teach, to be good examples to others. 
And that's where we are. We're not those who have seen. So we believe in Jesus through their word. Now notice in verse 21 what he doesn't pray for. That they be popular. He doesn't pray for them to be people who are uh, rich. He doesn't pray for them to be famous. The thing that was on the mind of Jesus before he was arrested and, and suffered for our sins was their oneness, their unity. He prays that they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Five times he mentions the word one in these passages. And now he's already prayed for the oneness of the apostles in verse 11. He wants them to be one. Now he's praying for the multitudes that will come after the apostles are dead throughout all time that they may be one. That the world may believe that you sent me. Verse 23 that they may be uh, perfected in world one, that the world may know that you have sent me. If unity brings belief from the world, what will division cause? What will division cause? Disbelief. Disbelief. I have talked to atheists, and one of the reasons why they're atheists, one of their excuses that they give is, because of all the division in the religious world. That is why they don't believe in the Bible. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe in God. Because look at all these different denominations contradicting one another. And what I tell them when they say that, I said, I understand your confusion. And I understand what you're saying. But that's exactly what Jesus said would happen. You have to understand this is not what Jesus wanted. And what I found also with a lot of atheists, what they're fighting against is Catholicism and Calvinism. They're not really fighting against biblical teaching. They, they're fighting against Calvinism. It's not, for, it's not fair, they say, that, that you say that a, a little baby is born a sinner. How could a little baby be a sinner? Well, I don't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach that. Calvinism does. Catholicism does. The Bible doesn't teach that. And so a lot of it's based on what they think Christians teach and what they think the Bible teaches because of all these denominations teaching it. And that's what they're fighting against. And um, one of them that I talked to was actually surprised that we don't celebrate the birthday of Jesus on December 25th. He was actually surprised that we didn't. I said, I don't. I said, I celebrate... December 25th, the same way you do. It's not religious to me. Nowhere in the Bible are we told to do that. And he actually admitted this. He said, what y'all do in churches of Christ is more in accord with what the Bible teaches than other groups. That's what an atheist said about our practice. Well, he knows the Bible. Yeah, this atheist is... This atheist knew the scriptures. He knew the Bible. He knew what it said. He's read it. But he believes it, it. He still believes it's false. He believes it's contradictions. In fact, that's why he reads it to try to find contradictions to, to use. And they're simply alleged contradictions. But um, Jesus said division would cause disbelief because unity causes belief. That they may be one that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you gave me, I've given them, verse 22, that they may be one just as we are one. The Father and the Son are one. The Father is not going to teach one doctrine and then the Son teach another doctrine that is contrary to the Father's doctrine. That's what you have in denominations. I heard about a preacher one time that was studying with a woman and trying to get her to obey the gospel, to be baptized. And she said the Holy Spirit told her she didn't need to be baptized. Is the Holy Spirit going to contradict the Father and the Son? No. 
She's listening again to her intuition, her feelings. And she's attributing that to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in perfect harmony with the Father and the Son. There is a oneness within the Godhead between the three of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as the Father and Son are one, we are to be one. Verse 23, I in them, you in me, that they may be perf- perfect in one, that the world may know that you sent me, and have loved them as you have uh, loved me. So there is that unity that's there that is very important and essential to, to give credence to and give um, uh, value to what we're teaching as far as the gospel message. When, when people actually fracture into all these different denominations, and there's about 38,000 different denominations, and then they'll turn around and they'll say, we're one, we have unity. Really? Seriously? You could go on a street corner, and if it's a four-way stop sign, you could find four different denominations on each corner of the street. They literally build walls in buildings to separate themselves from one another. That's not unity. And what they bought into, this lie of unity and diversity. Let's have unity and diversity. Let's agree to disagree. And, and uh, we, we believe in certain things, uh, but uh, other things we don't believe in uh, that we can't agree on. So we're just going to believe on certain things, and that's all that's necessary. No, that's, that is uh, something that is contrary to actual unity. The old preachers used to say you could take two tomcats and tie their tails together and hang it over a clothesline. Those cats have, have been united together. But do those cats have unity? What are those cats going to do? They're going to fight one another. You hang them over the clothesline, those cats are going to fight one another. They're connected, but they don't have unity. So just making the claim doesn't make it so. And if you only follow your intuition, you follow your your feelings, you're going to have division because people are going to feel like doing this, they're going to feel like doing that, and, and, and then there is that vast variety of chaos that is out there. What has there, what must there be for there to have for there to be unity? What has to be in place for unity to exist? A singular standard, an objective singular standard. Without it, there can be no unity. And when people say, oh, I believe the Bible plus this creed book, I believe the Bible plus this catechism, I believe the Bible uh, plus this, that, and the other, there's always going to be division. But when people say, I believe the Bible, and let's throw all this other stuff out, then there's going to be unity. Now, there's going to be disagreement sometimes in method or opinion. But you can still have unity. There are some brethren who don't believe in eating in a church building. They don't believe in having a kitchen in the church building. I can still have unity with them. I don't have to eat in the church building when I go over there with them. As long as they don't bind it and bind that opinion and cause division, then I'm fine with that. Uh, there are some brethren. I mean, we do things differently than most brethren. We have worship first, then Bible class. Most churches of Christ have Bible class first and then worship. That's fine. That, that's an area in which we can be flexible and we can have diversity. But that's opinion and method. And we can uh, be different when it comes to that. But when it comes to what we preach, the doctrine, we've got to be preaching the same thing. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1. One of the problems that the church at Corinth had is they had division within the congregation. And it was not acceptable to Paul because that wasn't acceptable to God. And Paul is writing to them, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. He says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. The only way we can have the same mind and the same judgment is to have the same standard. That's the only way we can be one. If we, we looked at this table up here, and each one of us guessed how long it is, how wide it is, how tall it is, and we went with eyeballing it and how we feel, we're going to get different answers. Each person is going to come up with a different answer. But if we take out an objective tape measure, that objective source of measurement, and measurement, measure it, then we have to agree with what it says. That's how long it is. That's how tall it is. That's how wide it is. That, those are the dimensions of it. And how I feel about it is irrelevant. And how you feel about it is irrelevant. Because we have gone to an objective standard and we have settled the matter by looking at that and comparing it to the objective standard. And what, go ahead. Right. We're going to do our own way of doing things, uh, you know, and so on and so forth, uh, and not even give letter of, of instruction because each one has to find their own way. You know, what's important is, is that we would all believe in Christ. And, of course, right. we, so what my point is, then when you go back to Ephesians 4.4 4, where there's one faith, and Paul here is saying, hey, we've got to be of one mind, we all have to be united. And that's why the letters were going out to make sure everybody was on the same page. Right. And so the denominations that say this, uh, that we can all, uh, we, we're just going to all do things a little bit differently, but that's not what the letters have Right. That, that's the conventional wisdom, what, what she said to you. You know, and when I was on the TV program there, uh, what does the Bible say there in uh, Reedsville, Virginia, people would call in, and they would say something similar to that. And our response would be, a lot of people believe that way. But where does the Bible teach that? Click. They'd hang up. They didn't want to talk anymore. Or they'd say something insulting and hang up. <laughs> but that's what, uh, where, where does the Bible say that? That all that matters is that we believe in Jesus and we go our separate ways and we're all going to, where does the Bible say that? It doesn't teach that. That's what people want to believe. Because that, again, gets their emotions, makes, makes them feel better, that even though I'm not in the same uh, church as these people over here, we're all going to wind up in the same place. So I don't have to worry about converting these people over here to my way of thinking because they're going to get there in their way of thinking. And, and so... Um, that's, that's not biblical thinking. And as you said, and that's a good point, these letters were sent out to do away with that concept. And if unity and diversity or just believing in Jesus is all that was necessary, why send out these letters to correct this? You think about uh, Paul writing to the Galatians. Their problem wasn't with the nature of Jesus. They believed Jesus was the Son of God. They believed in His deity. They believed in His humanity. And they were just going back to Old Testament practices. And if Paul were, were like some today, he'd say, well, you know, I don't believe that way, but we're all heading to the same place. You've got to do what's right for you. He said, you're believing another gospel. And it's not another. And you're going to be accursed. You're going to be lost. In fact, you have fallen from grace. 
Galatians 5 and verse 4. He didn't believe in this unity and diversity. The only way that that is true is when it comes to opinion. When it comes to opinion. And Romans 14 tells us how to deal with that. We're not to push our opinion and we're to be flexible when it comes to other people's opinion. And we are, based upon the biblical principle of love, work all that out. But baptism isn't an opinion. How the church worships isn't an opinion. The organization of the church isn't an opinion. I mean, these are things that are are rock solid within the Word of God. And so, as we look at how unity that Jesus prayed for is being pleaded for, here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, that there be no divisions among you, you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Now, I understand that there are some people who are not going to be at the same level of understanding when it comes to their recent conversion. They're going to still have some thinking that may not be in line with the Word of God because they are fresh converts. That's where the further instruction comes along. But the older members are to guide and bring along those younger babes in Christ to help them understand the truth and not accommodate their misunderstandings. And that's what happens with, uh, when, we, when we try to accommodate and adopt denominational thinking. And he goes on to say there in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 11, It's been declared to me concerning you, my brother, my Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. And now I say that each one of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? No. Was Paul crucified for you? No. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I baptized in my own name. So they were being loyal to the that baptized them and following that person. And Paul says, you're missing the point. You got it all wrong. That's why he says in verse 17, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, uh, wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. In other words, Paul preached the gospel. He didn't have to do the physical baptizing. Other people could do it. He wasn't diminishing the essential nature of baptism here. He's saying, I don't want you to follow me. I don't want you to follow me if I baptize you. It's very interesting when you read John chapter 4, Jesus baptized more people than John, but Jesus himself didn't do the physical baptizing. His disciples did. Because what would you have? You'd have some people say, I was baptized by Jesus himself. Andrew over here, he was just baptized by John. I was baptized by Jesus. You see that human pride. So Jesus took himself out of the equation. But did that diminish the importance of baptism? No. It's essential. So being one is essential. And that's what Jesus prayed for here. And this causes people to believe when they see a unity that is there. Very interesting. I know that there within churches of Christ that there are some problems. But when you look at the overall statistics of churches of Christ compared to other religious groups, there is more unity that is found there than you find in denominationalism. There is more unity that's found there. Now, I know that we know of problems because churches of Christ are made up of humans, and therefore there's the difficulty and the human element is there. But statistically, when you look at churches of Christ, it's been shown that among us there is more unity in what we believe and practice than in denominationalism. For example, did you know there is about 30 to 35 different kind of Baptist churches? There's numerous Methodist churches. There's numerous Presbyterian churches. There are thousands of different Pentecostal denominations. Division, division, fracture, fracture, division. Oh, God called me. I'm going to start a church over here. I'm, oh, I'm going to start a church over there. 
There are some churches, and Jennifer and I were talking about this one day, they'll be the same building, it will go through five or six church different names within two or three months. It'll be the, the house of God. Then next month it'll be the Living Water Church. Then the next month it'll be Open Door Fellowship. So what, what's happening there? Either they're going out of business and they're selling or they're changing their name every few months. This congregation has been, and I'm not saying the present membership, but this congregation has been here since the 1930s. It's been the Lord's Church in this area since the 1930s when someone planted a congregation here been at this location since the 1960s to be one that brings glory to God we should strive for unity and we don't have unity when we compromise the truth compromising the truth to have unity is not biblical unity we have unity when we speak the same things we have the same mind and the same judgment Back to the prayer, John chapter 17. That they may be one as we are one. There are not 38,000 differences between the Father and the Son. Yet there are 38,000 different denominations in our world today. Right. That unity that's there among the congregations is a good thing, and uh, and it makes an impression on people. Um, I remember when we did some mission work in Jamaica, that there was uh, there were some people that were visiting there from the community, and you had people from all over the United States that were in this mission trip some from Tennessee, some from Florida, some from Texas. And what one of the visitors remarked, uh, one of their remarks was they were amazed at the unity of the message that was being preached in the gospel meetings that we were having, in the tent meetings we were having. We were preaching the same thing, but you had people who were brethren from Tennessee, Texas, Florida, different backgrounds, different skin color, but they were all preaching the same message. And that impressed a visitor, that unity of the message that was there. And so when a person is, is determined to do what the Bible says and do away with uh, any addition to it or any subtraction of it, then they will have unity with like-minded brethren. Verse 23, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfect in one, that the world may know that you sent me and have loved me, love them as you have loved me. I in them. How is Christ in us? I thought he was in heaven. He's in us in the word, exactly. That's how the spirit is in us. That's how the father is in us. That's how the Son is in us, through the influence and the medium of the Word of God. And so there is that uh, influence that is there and having God's will in our life. So unity uh, must be achieved not only uh, among churches of Christ as far as uh, something that we should all strive for. It, uh, Matt alluded to Ephesians 4, and next week, Lord willing, I'm going to preach a lesson on Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 and verse 1, Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, brethren, walk worthy of the calling with which you are called, with all lowliness and gentleness, long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. There is the attitude that we've got to have. There is the disposition of our heart for us to have unity. We have to be Lowly people can't be prideful. We've got to be gentle people, can't be harsh. We've got to be long-suffering. 
That means we have to uh, be patient with one another. We have to bear with one another in love. That means we put up with one another in a loving attitude when it comes to opinions or different ways of doing things. We have to have this attitude there. But we're all, verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The unity comes from the Holy Spirit through His Word. There is one body, one church, one Spirit, just as you are called and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. So there is the seven planks in the platform uh, of unity look you look at chapter 2 ephesians 2 god wants all men to be saved in the same church his church the one body of christ look at verse 14 ephesians 2 and verse 14 for he himself is our peace who has made both one that's jew and gentile one and has broken down the middle wall of separation having abolished in his flesh the enmity That is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. That's the old law, Old Testament. So as to create in himself one new man from the two thus making peace. In Christ there is but one church, one new man thus making peace. Verse 16, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body. There's the church again, in one church through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. So, the true Savior and the true gospel produces the true church, and there's only one of those. One new man, that's the one church. One body, that's the one church. And salvation is found in that one body. And churches of Christ are in that one body. Denominations are outside that one body. And when someone thinks that somehow the denominations are part of the one body, again, the burden of proof is on them. You've got to show that to me in the Bible. You show it to me, I'll start preaching it. That's what I would tell them on TV. When I was on TV, they'd call in, if you show this to me, I'll start preaching it you got to show it to me first and they can't do it because it's not biblical it's a lie that's comforting a comforting lie that's what they want to believe it's it's easy on the emotions to believe that way but it's not the truth it's not the truth there's only one god one savior one body and that body is to be one And when we have this disposition of our heart, it's going to be God's way, not my way. We're going to do things God's way, and I'm going to be humble toward my brethren when there's a difference of opinion. Uh, We'll have unity. If unity is connected to love here, and it is, as you see this in verse 21, 22, and 23, It's connected to the love of God and and giving God glory. Division and discord is out of hatred. And it dishonors God. It brings dishonor to God. That's why sowing discord within a congregation is very, very serious. It's a sin and needs to be repented of. Any questions or comments about that before we go just a little bit further and we'll be finished with this prayer? So we need to ask ourselves as individuals, what am I doing to promote unity within the congregation? Am I trying to promote unity? Or do I have the attitude it's either my way or the highway? If I don't get my way here, I'm going someplace else. If I don't get my way here, I'm going to sow discord. I'm going to make people, I'm going to cause division within the church. That's not from God. That's from the devil. We got to be striving for unity, but not compromise. Never compromise.
figuring out what God's will is uh, from the scriptures and, and realizing, uh, you know, we don't want to disrupt the harmony within a congregation to push our will or push our understanding. Um, again, uh, that does not mean we compromise any doctrine of the scripture, whether it be on divorce or remarriage, whether it be on baptism or, or worship. We don't, we don't compromise, but if, if someone uh, uh, wants to have five songs before the sermon instead of three, okay. If someone wants to have one verse of seven songs before the sermon, the first verse of seven songs and then the sermon, okay. Someone wants to have the sermon first, then the songs. Of course, we need to meet with the men and just, okay, is that what we want? Okay, we'll do that. Some people have thinking that they think is absolute when it's not really the, the way it is. But as far as, you know, you know, bringing up not having Wednesday night service and such, a lot of churches uh, don't have Sunday night service or Wednesday. They say people aren't interested. This congregation disproves that. You know about 95% of this congregation comes back every single service. And that can't be said for a lot of churches. That can't be said. 95% of this membership comes back. Right. Or Thursday. I preached for a church that had a Thursday night service. But, you know, you're right. We have to understand, you know, what the Bible's will is and then understand respecting the authority of an individual congregation when they say we need to meet on Wednesday night. That's good for us. That's beneficial for us. And then understand the Bible's teaching, you obey that authority of that local congregation, whether it be elders or whatever it might be. Okay, uh, very good discussion. We'll finish up John 17 and go into John chapter 18, uh, Wednesday night, Lord willing.